Okay. Hello from Brussels. My name is Martin Penny, the Head of Communication at the Executive Agency for the ERC. In this video today, we will provide more information about a new type of ERC grant, the ERC Plus grants. Now, you've probably heard about the Choose Europe initiative and President von der Leyen's speech at the Sorbonne on the 5th of May, where she called for ERC Super Grants to offer a longer term perspective to the very best and brightest researchers and scientists from Europe and around the world, to use her words. The Scientific Council has already taken action and doubled the funding offered to researchers relocating to Europe for an ERC grant. A second step to deliver this vision is happening right now. The ERC Scientific Council has created a call for proposals for a new type of grant, which is called ERC Plus. This is included in an update to the 2026 ERC Work Programme, which has now been formally adopted by the European Commission. Now, I'm sure there'll be huge interest in these grants and learning more about what they offer. And so I'm delighted to be able to discuss these today with the President of the European Research Council, Professor Maria Leptin. Hi. Maria, welcome and thank you for joining us today. So Maria, first of all, can you explain what the ERC Plus grants are and what they will offer? Yes, they are an individual grant for individual applicants, uh, for outstanding researchers, who have ideas for projects, for aims that cannot be achieved with a regular ERC grant. Mm -hmm. um, for all stages, starting consolidator or advanced grant level. Um, for example, because they want to completely shift the paradigm in their field, because they want to uh, open up a new field. So individual, but going beyond what could be achieved with a regular ERC grant. Thank you. Can you say something about the budget and duration? You've talked about the ambition of these grants, but what about the budget and duration? Well, they're big grants, mm -hmm. which is consistent with the idea that the applicants really want to develop something really profoundly new. Uh, they're for up to seven years and for okay. up to seven million euros. So Maria, apart from the budget size and the duration, what are the key differences from the other grants? So in terms of writing the application, there aren't many differences. It will have the same at part one and part two. Um, but in addition to that, uh, we are requesting a kind of a vision statement. Okay. Uh, the purpose of that is to really explain how is this special? Why is this bigger, uh, more exciting, more groundbreaking, okay. more potentially changing than a regular grant? We're hoping that applicants will cover that in about half a page. Uh, we're allowing up to two pages, but really that special bit ought to be presentable in half a page. And another thing um, that is uh, different in this grant from the others is it's really uh, only once in anybody's career. So people should think very hard whether this is the right time to apply for it, mm -hmm. because once they've had it, they can never apply again, which already implies that we're hoping we don't have to restrict this to two years, uh, the next two years of this framework program. But those are the two things, half page, vision, and only once in your career. Okay, so you say only once in your career. Mm -hmm. So will researchers with a starting grant or a consolidated grant profile be able to apply for these grants? Absolutely, absolutely. We've discussed this. Many of our applicants are concerned that if they're young and they don't have a long CV with many uh, grant publications, they uh, lose out against the more advanced people who have mm -hmm. all this. But we had a long discussion about this in the Scientific Council, and of course council members are all people who judge uh, researchers all the time during appointments, uh, promotions, prizes, grants, and everybody agreed that it is a piece of cake to judge people according to their career stage, even if they're competing for the same grant. So, and in fact, the idea came up that uh, if anything, the young people are more exciting <laughs> and more adventurous than the, the more established people. So yes, we think uh, anybody can apply and we are 
very confident that our panels will be able to judge people at their career stage for their particular excellence and potential to achieve breakthroughs. Thank you, very clear. And I'm sure that will have answered a lot of questions people will have. In my opening remarks, I talked about the Choose Europe initiative. Yes. Can you clarify whether these grants are equally open to those, to researchers already in Europe, or is it preferentially targeted at those returning or coming to Europe? They're open to everyone. Okay. The trigger was, um, of course, the situation in the US where we thought if uh, anybody is really, uh, has become unable to do their research in the US and wants to come to Europe, uh, we should do what we can to help. We, of course, already have the top-up possibility for incoming people. And again, it's not only US, it's anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. um, but if Europe is to be attractive, it also has to be attractive for people who are already here. So, uh, and President von der Leyen was clear in her statements about this. It's for those who are already here and those who are coming in. Okay. So Maria, one of the things people may be concerned about, isn't this new grant scheme taking away money which would be normally given to the other types of grants? That would be a concern, but there are two answers to that. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is that President von der Leyen and Commissioner Zakharyeva have actually given us extra funds for this. So they've okay. allocated extra budget, uh, which we're, of course, extremely grateful for. Um, but it also means, or, there, or, or it's an and, uh, we will be awarding only 30 grants. Now, okay. that is uh, something that applicants should know, because these 30 grants are, of course, across all fields um, and across all career stages. And you have to compare that to the thousand grants that we otherwise award every year. So it's going to be 30 times as competitive. And I should add another thing about the profile you asked about before. Yes, all career stages. And we do believe that they're creative uh, people and you know people with a record that shows that they qualify. Uh, for these grants at all career stages. But what's also clear is with a 30-fold lower chance of getting one, we and with that much money for that long time, we are looking for people who've really demonstrated that they um, can do very ambitious projects, that they have successfully done something that no one else has ever done okay. before. And like, again, that kind of been at the postdoctoral level, it can be uh, at any level of the career, but we're really looking for those very few who've demonstrated they can do that and who come up with an idea that is worth one of the 30 grants. Okay, thank you, very clear, and I think it gives people a better understanding of who potentially could be the target audience for yes, this type of exactly, grant. Yes, exactly, exactly. We've got to be clear about that. We don't want to create huge disappointments about uh, failed grants. I understand. But then, can you tell me a little bit more about how the grants will be evaluated? In step one, the panels will look at the part that they would look at for a normal grant, part one, which explains the current state of the field, the questions and the aims, and the approach that is to mm -hmm. be used. In the case of the PLUS grants, they will also look at the vision statement. Okay. Normally, at step one, we don't put much weight on the applicant. We really focus on the project. And then look at step two, look at the CV at the applicant. Here, we will look at the applicant because we do feel, just to reiterate this, to justify awarding seven million, mm -hmm. we need some evidence sure. that the person has achieved something uh, that's, that they can be entrusted with seven million. And in step two, that, okay, so the step two will have a special panel. Step one will be uh, uh, evaluated by existing panels. For step two, we will put together uh, a panel or panels of very experienced evaluators. Mm -hmm. So past chairs of panels, past council members, uh, leaders of organizations that are very experienced in evaluating. And they will uh, then 
receive all the materials from step one, the external reports, the reports from the panel from step one, and compare these across all fields. So that'll be a very exciting panel. And um, feasibility will be looked at there. They will have expert reports, but also the big picture. And will there be interviews in step two? There will be interviews, yes. Thank you. These applicants will be interviewed. Okay. So Maria, my final question is about the timetable. Can you tell me when the call for proposals will be opened and when we can see the first ERC Plus grants awarded and starting? It'll be opened in June next year. So that gives people enough time to prepare. Sure. An amazing grant. The call will close in September and um, announcements will be made at the end of the year or early in 27. And so people can start in 27. Thank you very much for answering my questions, Maria, and providing these additional explanations on ERC Plus grants. I'm sure you've answered many of the questions which the research community may have. And now I turn to, to you and the research community to respond to the call for proposals, and we look forward to seeing your ideas.